Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. In today's episode, I want to share with you a dialogue that I had with, with an Eastern Orthodox apologist, Craig Trulia. And so Craig and I sat down not to talk about something we fundamentally disagree about, like, let's say, the papacy, but to talk about something where we have fundamental agreement, substantive agreement, and that is why we both are not Protestant. Sometimes when I sit down with Protestants, I'll ask them, why are you Protestant? Not just why aren't you Catholic, but why are you Protestant? And I've noticed a lot of times the answers will be, I'm Protestant because I'm not Catholic. I'll talk about this more in my forthcoming book, When Protestants Argue Like Atheists, because I feel like that this is kind of an illicit shifting of the burden of proof. I've talked about that before here on the podcast. Because I'll ask them, well, why, yeah, why are you Protestant? And I'll hear, well, I don't believe in the papacy, or I don't believe in the dogma of the Assumption of Mary. Okay, well, why wouldn't you be Eastern Orthodox then if your big concern is, let's say, the papacy or the dogma of the Assumption of Mary? Because in the Eastern Church, you have long-standing traditions about Mary's dormition, for example, things like that. And then I'll ask them, and I, I get these very light answers. And I feel like for many of these Protestants, it's, I'm Protestant because I looked at Catholicism, I'm not convinced, I'm not as familiar with Eastern Orthodoxy, Protestantism is just more comfortable, it's what I was raised in, or it's my community. Honestly, I think that happens often. So that's why I want to really press them on that, and I thought it would be so interesting to have another non-Catholic perspective on Protestantism, for Craig and I to be able to sit down and just chat about that. So uh, I shared a little bit of my thoughts, and then Craig actually had like this very long, uh, detailed list, and it's great, and so he shares it, and then I, I hop in every now and then to say, here's, here's also my, my thoughts with that, where I agree, and a few points where I actually disagree with him, because you would expect that uh, just because two people are not something, like they're not Protestant, doesn't mean they're going to agree on everything else. So it was a real treat to be able to sit down with him. I hope to engage in further theological discussions with him in the future. Uh, but for now, here is our conversation, a Catholic and an Orthodox explain why they are not Protestant. Check it out. And so I'm not sure if the reason you have that you're not Protestant is the overwhelming evidence against it, but how about you start unpacking for us your <laughs> reasonings, and then we'll go into mine, and, and we'll interject and do it all together at that point. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be brief then about the reasons for me. And what's, what's interesting is that my reasons might be different from other people who are Catholic, who, like you said, maybe they grew up in the Catholic Church, and so they're not Protestant because they have that kind of inertia of being Catholic, and they've never seen a reason to leave the church that they love. Uh, but for me, being a convert it is very different, especially a convert from deism. Uh, so, I mean, when I was in junior high and high school, I believed there was a God out there, but I, wasn't, I didn't subscribe to any religion. So I, I approached Christianity from kind of like this neutral vantage point. And so I, I was first convinced of mere Christianity. Like, look, if I investigate philosophy and history, there is a God. He raised Jesus from the dead. Christianity is true. But then now what do I do? And so one of the reasons, probably the biggest reason that I'm not Protestant is I don't see how you can get across the gap from mere Christianity. There is a God and Jesus rose from the dead to what I would call mere Protestantism. You have uh, a 27-book canon of the New Testament. Divine revelation is, is found explicitly and only there. Uh, d it, divine revelation ended, public revelation ended in the first century. Uh, and th this is a very specific canon. This is the authority for Christians, the sole infallible rule of faith, what you might call mere Protestantism. And one reason that I, I'm not Protestant is that I don't see how you can get the gap from mere Christianity to that authority structure playing by the rules of Protestantism. I don't see sola scriptura in scripture or uh, in, the, in church history, especially amongst the apostolic fathers. Uh, when I look at Protestants who try to cite sola scriptura, it's usually from post-Nicene fathers, not from anti-Nicene. Maybe they get one thing out of Irenaeus and Hippolytus, but but that's it. But but tradition and Episcopal authority, it, it, all, se it all seems very clear to me. So I, I, I can't get from the gap from mere Christianity to um, mere Protestantism without something like sacred tradition 
or an authoritative teaching office in a hierarchical church. And if I get those things to get me to, let's say, the, the canon of the New Testament, I've now gone past mere Protestantism by, in, by invoking um, another authority. So for me, like when I dialogue with a, a Protestant about, well, here's why I don't accept the papacy. These biblical proof texts aren't enough. There's not enough uh, support in, let's say, the Antonicene fathers. It's, it's too ambiguous. Well, if that's not good enough to prove the papacy, it's not good enough to prove pro mere Protestant authority. The 27-book canon of the New Testament, coupled with Sola Scriptura, the purpose, perspicuity of Scripture. Uh, then I, I also think, now I know that some Protestants don't like hearing this, that it sounds cliche. Uh, Pat, Patrick Madrid once said that Sola Scriptura is a blueprint for anarchy. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily put it that far. But I had my dialogue with uh, the other Paul and Father James from Barely Protestant. And we were talking about, well, do are Protestants in agreement about essential doctrines? And really, that dialogue was interesting. I feel like the other Paul said, well, no, but that doesn't matter. And Father James said, yeah, but if you, you just have but, but you just have to define a Protestant as being everybody who believed things in like the first seventy five years of Protestantism. And even then, there are also important disagreements. But you redefine it so much, and I just don't think that works because evangelicals outnumber historic Protestants now two to one in the U.S. Like that, when people say Protestant, they they mean evangelical, non-denominational. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, that really, if you if they're not Protestants, I want to know what are these people? Like, what term are are, are we going to use? Uh, and for me, you might if you try to distinguish them, like they're evangelicals rather than Protestants. They're using really the same sola scriptura methodology. They've just chosen to accept some traditions and not others, but they're using sola scriptura in, in that regard. Uh, so it creates these kinds of, of really, you don't have the, the essentials. You don't have unity in the essentials. And I believe that Christ would give us a visible means of at least understanding the essentials of the faith that we, that we need to have. Um, Another, uh, I'll do, let's see, I've got one or two other things here. Uh, one, and it's also hard to say why I'm not Protestant. It's because it's so, such a big target, right? Because if I wasn't Catholic, I'd be Orthodox. And if I wasn't Orthodox, I'd probably be Anglican or something like that. Uh, but, for, but for a lot of Protestantism, to me, it contradicts what's in Scripture. I think Calvinism clearly does. Uh, you know, A lot of things where Scripture exhorts us to do something, uh, or or to avoid something, there's there's a, there's contradictions there, especially with the sacraments uh, about works really justifying us. They really do increase our righteousness before God uh, in cooperation with Christ, of course. Uh, the other two would be a lack of a sense of the liturgy uh, of the Christian tradition coming to us, not just through the written word, but that the liturgy is is a way of receiving that apostolic truth and transmitting it, that it's not just something we do on Sundays, that that's really like the beating heart of the faith. Uh, and then just its lack of uh, historical connection. Uh, I'm actually really interested. I know Gavin Ortland's been doing a lot more work on this. I think he's going to write a book on it because uh, I think Protestants have not tried to take the fathers seriously, seriously. And I know he has, and I fundamentally disagree with him on a lot of his interpretation of the fathers. But I really that that historical disconnect for many forms, especially of evangelicalism or non-denominationalism, that's very difficult for me. That if you're going to do something like make an argument from silence against something like the Assumption of Mary, I think that's incredibly fatal to the central pillars of Protestantism that you also do not find not just in the Apostolic Church, but many of those doctrines like eternal security, you don't find until you get to get to Calvin or forensic justification. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. So that's, that's a lot that I've, that I've thrown out there on the liturgy thing. Maybe I'll put this at the bottom level because our most important reasons should come first. Uh, like I said, if I picked among Protestantism, it'd be a high church thing I'd go with. When I first went, to, when I was first investigating Christianity, I went to some Protestant churches. They were, now they were like non-denominational evangelical and it always felt kind of like hip and trying to be almost commercial or trying to wow me with a, a, a good product. Not, not to downplay a Protestants who are very faithful, and they are. If anything, Protestants, like if I look at graphic design, I can know whether it's Protestant or Catholic, uh, because <laughs> if it's good, it's probably made by a Protestant. And if it's cheesy or not good, it's probably made by a Catholic. You know, 
Um, that and it doesn't just, exist. It, it's orthodox. Yeah, right. <laughs> if it's just <laughs> etched out on a multi multicolored candelabra somewhere, then it's uh, then it's orthodox. <laughs> um, but but when I went, it was just like, oh, I remember once I went to a church where it was a converted storage facility. So it was like um, they took like an old, you know, you go to a U-Haul storage, right? And it's got all the little U-Haul. Like I, you drive in a big U-Haul facility, you drive your truck in. There's all these little pods with these storage facilities. So this church bought it, and they converted each of the pods into it was one campus with like five churches in it. Okay, so mm. so it's like one church, but if you go to this building, it's white vestments and linens and traditional hymns. And if you go to the other building on the property, it's rock and roll. And another property is it's a coffee shop, and the sermon is played on the TV. Right. And so every, and I'm not saying every Protestant church is like this, obviously. But that sense of when I would go to these churches, I felt like how oh, everyone's it's, it's too slick. It's too slick. Everyone's really nice and impeccably dressed and coming to greet me and talk to me. I was almost relieved when I went to a Catholic church and somebody just handed me the the worship aid and no one talked to me. And I just kind of walked in and nothing was <laughs> and it's not slick in that regard because I felt there's almost like kind of an authenticity in that respect. And I feel like in the apostolic communities, whether it's Catholic or Orthodox, you have that more ancient sense and something that, that is adopted more modern understandings of what's um, aesthetics, if you will. So that's what I'll, I'll throw out there. And I'd love to hear yours and I'll jump in every now and then for concurrences or dissent. So well, please, please drop in because they always have me on this channel. They don't always have you. And so just from the onset, I want to talk about there's common reasons why people stay Orthodox and Catholic, which aren't intellectually compelling, but in the real world are compelling, even if there's not this super high mindedness about it. And a lot of Orthodox and Catholics stay as such because their family has been such forever, right? Family ties. Uh, they don't see any pressing reason to leave. You know, that they're following Christ. They're going to church. They're worshiping. They love God. In a humble way, they're like, all right, why do, why do I need something else? I'm happy where I am. I think something that you never hear in apologetics, but is very important in the real world, is that Orthodox and Catholicism offers spiritual support. And what do I mean by this? You could go to confession. There's a liturgical calendar with fasts and holidays where you start to get a, a, a life rhythm that's around the gospel. and so without even thinking too hard about it. It's a it's a Friday because you fast that day, you know, well, Christ died for me this day. And it informs how you act, how you live. Uh, it's, it, well, it's funny how we think of our stomach so much. It's interesting <laughs> to see Protestants, right, Protestants kind of adopting this stuff. Like Protestants who will talk more about Lent or... Uh, it's interesting when I read somebody like Alexander Hislop, uh, who wrote The Two Babylons, that's like... That that's the 19th century source for all the Jack Chick fundamentalism stuff out there. Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. And he tries to say, look, Catholicism is rehashed paganism, but he's not like a modern Protestant because he'll say uh, Christmas and Easter are pagan. The Bible doesn't talk about celebrating Easter, doesn't talk about celebrating Christ's birth. Uh, so it's fascinating to me that the more original Protestants uh, you know, would, well, it, it, it depends, right? You have like the first generation of the Reformation, like Lutherans and Anglicans still retaining things like the liturgical calendar. Then you get mm -hmm. more into like the 19th century uh, Calvinists and other rise of fundamentalism, really outright rejecting this stuff. But then more of its resurgence coming back because it is good for us, like you said, and then people have a natural affinity for it. And it's... Right? Why leave? You're just used to it. You're being fed spiritually, right? Yeah. Why would someone leave? And and people are making comments. And the Eucharist, they live for the Eucharist every Sunday. So you're being fed both spiritually and physically. And so people just feel this draw to keep coming and no reason to leave. And I think one thing which you were hinting at about Protestantism, which you don't really have as much. There, there is diversity, internal diversity, of course, in Orthodoxy and Catholicism is the general, keywords general uniformity between parishes, right? So I could get a, a change of venue. Let's say something happens with the priest here or whatever. 
or I have kids and, I, and then there's a new priest town with a family and there's more family support there. I could change parishes without like my whole life being upended. And now there's new doctrines and everything. Yeah. And so there's a sort of repeatability, even though there's eternal diversity, but far, far less diversity, which you're going to get in Protestantism because epistemic reasons, right? Even within Lutheranism, you can have more eternal diversity. It doesn't matter that they're all Lutheran. They'll be all over the place. And it's because, quite frankly, it's edifice built on sola scriptura. Yeah, I mean, you'll have now, uh, you'll have some Protestants that are in the same church, but the church ends up splitting over homosexuality. Like, I mean, even among Catholics, we have, you know, we got wonky, some wonky priests and one wonky cardinal. But the teaching is understood, and you know who someone's dissenting from it, and uh, others are not. Uh, you know, you, but you 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 still go and you still have the universal catechism, you know, for every church. I think that's a good point. And I think, honestly, because the center point of our worship is the Eucharist, it's sort of you could look past the homiletics <laughs> to some degree, if, even if they're pretty bad, because that's not the most important thing. But in Protestantism, it's the other way around. They'll commune anyone, but they're not going to let anyone preach because that's that's the the center of their worship. Yeah. Now, before I get to my reasons for not being Protestant, let me give what I perceive to be common reasons for leaving Protestantism among other people. Hmm. Um, and one would be love for church history. People just get kind of obsessed with this and. It's important if it informs your understanding of scripture and worship and helps you grow in humility and repentance, but it could be excessive. It almost becomes a kind of factoid thing. It's I've heard people uh, say I could tell people become orthodox if they're into history. And so it's a common reason. It's not terribly spiritual. So it's something people should be mindful of. Mm-hmm. There is also I hear a, a lot among both. Roman Catholics and Orthodox is this kind of desire for epistemic certainty. It's as if, you know, how do we know the scriptures are true? Well, we have an infallible authority that could determine what they mean. But as I've said elsewhere, that's sort of like kicking the can down the road. All right. So then what interprets infallible authority? But the, it, it is a huge reason why a lot of people will leave Protestantism. And it's uh, it's something where I think, for intellectual reasons, is not all compelling, because um, there's a problem of interpretation because we're all fallible people. Yeah, I don't Another... like that argument when it's when it's pushed too hard. For me, it's more mm-hmm. I have a better chance at arriving at these truths and having a foundation through a Catholic epistemology than a Protestant one. So I, I put it more, almost even more probabilistically than just. You know, I agree. You don't want to over overstretch that argument. And I think the last one, which is actually, I think, a good one, mm-hmm. is a love for the church. People read the scriptures. They they see the body of Christ being referred to. It's a literal body. It speaks of there's different members with different gifts. They see that there's actual ordination of bishops, and they have a role. They're ordained by other bishops, and they want what the scriptures teach. They want what's really there. And so that's a very common reason they have this this love for the church and the church is the body of Christ. So why not, right? Well, I, I think the other thing is they love the church, but I think when one of the reasons that that I'm not Protestant is that when I read scripture and look at the early fathers, the church is not merely the invisible bond that exists between the baptized. And so I feel like that if you love the church, that's very difficult in Protestantism when the word church has such a minimal understanding to it, that if it really is just the bond that exists between Christians, well, that doesn't have, that can, in Protestantism, that can't possibly have authority over me since everybody disagrees on so many things. And I know you'll bring up the point about schism later, which I think is super important, that if you have the church, it's like, okay, as long as we're all Christian, whatever that means to people, then you you know, you can have all kinds of disagreements and lack of communion with with other people. It, it just be like calling it a church. It almost the word really loses its meaning, I think, unless you have some kind of sacred order. So the word hierarchy means a sacred order uh, within it. So I so I think that if you're right. If someone loves the church and you ask about pro, like Protestant ecclesiology, 
it's um, kind of bare bones what you'll find. And it's uh, and we'll unpack that in in way more detail. Mm -hmm. um, so now, finally, my reasons <laughs> why I'm not Protestant. And I think this is a real obvious one. So I'll start with this: no Protestant sect really does everything the scriptures require. Right? You think that's a kind of basic thing, but no Protestant sect does this. We have confession. But pretty much there's order for confession, let's say Lutherans, but no one really does it. Um, Anglicans technically have confession, but no one really does it. It's mostly in disuse. And that's why it's increasing uh, disuse in Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism is a kind of Protestantization of our faith, which is bad. Because what do the scriptures say? First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why would we not have confession? It's it's so common for people to say, I'm not going to confess my sins to the other person. That's not necessary for salvation. Haven't you read the Bible? This is what the Bible talks about. You know, don't we want to confess? We, we read about this in James 5, 16, that we confess to the elders. And so, which is presbyters, which is the Greek word priest, so people know. So that being said, it seems to me that, yeah. all right, for a Protestant sect doesn't let me actually do what the scriptures say. Well, what's interesting so, is when you look in the New like I would ask the Protestant, where does the New Testament tell us to confess our sins to God or to confess our sins to Jesus? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that. It says to confess our sins, but in each context, it's talking about to other people. James 5 is the presbyters, the priests. First John 1 John 1.9, I mean, I see Protestants quote this all the time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. The assumption is that, well, because God will forgive our sins, we must be confessing our sins to God. That's not uh, warranted in the passage, because if you look at the verses before and after, it's talking about when we are saying things in public to other people. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. It's talking about when we tell other people whether we are or aren't a sinner. So John is saying here, look, don't tell other people you're not a sinner. Tell other people your sins. Uh, so it's very clear here. This, this is, and of course, with John 20, 23, with the apostles having the, this unique story. But I, I think that's a, but I think that's a great point that, you know, the Bible would give us, you know, very clear. What do we do if we grievously sin after we have been baptized? Sure. I mean, it's going to happen. It happens to people. You think you think Christ would give us an answer to that. And he does in this sacrament. And it's because in a modern context, the ancient form of confession, both our communions is much muted. Mm -hmm. um, Ex homo Jesus, uh, the confession of sins was a public affair in the early church. Right. The absolution was given by a priest, but the it was a public kind of penance as a public confession. And St. Ambrose talks about it. It would be so that way the people in the parish could pray for you and for your sin, or they could, you're a kneeler. So they know, all right, he did this sort of sin. That's, that's what they need help with. Right. And you could see, well, when the church became more widespread and not persecuted anymore. It kind of like, well, you don't want everyone knowing Mr. Smith's business because they're going to use that against them politically. And confession became increasingly private in in orthodoxy, there's still confession in front of people, but you whisper in the in the priest's ear, so you could kind of see the vestiges of the yeah. earlier practice. But that's why you know you would read you know the passage from First John, and someone in the first, second, third, fourth century, we know exactly what it's talking about because right. there is a public audience. You know, you know to not confess your sins in front of them would be to say you know to to be a liar because everyone's doing it. Right. And because we're divorced from that context, increasingly so, even just visually, people can't make the connection. Now, another thing I think is, again, the scriptures say we ought to be doing these things, but you don't really see in Protestantism, is, well, just like how the Eucharist. You know, Jesus Christ says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John 6, 5, 3. You think, okay, I would be very careful to spiritualize this this passage, and I think it doesn't actually pertain to eating his flesh and blood, which he says is the bread and wine. And so that's why I have to say, is it morally safe to not commune when the literal and simplest interpretation, right? We're talking about the perspicuity of scriptures. 
literal and simplest interpretation of the scriptures demand that this pertains to the Eucharist. Yeah. All right. And so let's just be honest. Perspic perspicuity of the scriptures only applies when it disagrees with Orthodox and Catholic doctrines. And so that makes the Protestants inconsistent. They will, they will invoke perspicuity when like, oh, I don't see the assumption in Revelation 12. Uh, you know, I don't see the Ark of the Covenant as the Theotokos. I don't understand that typology. You know, the scriptures are simpler. Yeah, but or, yet, or, or purgatory. Or it doesn't like apply that. anymore. Yeah. Um, I also think just generally, just look at the scriptures. When they speak of self-examination um, and, and Eucharistic piety, you know, like you actually take serious that the sacrament could kill you if you commune unworthily. Does any Protestant really believe this? Right? Like, you know... They're giving communion to everyone. They, I know Protestant churches that give communion to people that aren't baptized. No one, none of them seriously believe you could get sick and die, as St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. And so as they claim, well, faith is what saves us. The Eucharist contributes nothing to salvation. Then why would you ever commune if it could kill you? No. What, what I don't like, and I think Protestants should be mindful of this, is sometimes when we're investigating these issues— I feel like a Protestant will start with the presumption that baptism is for showing that I'm a Christian or the Eucharist symbolizes my relationship with Christ and the Catholic and Orthodox say different. Uh, and if they can't make their case, then I'm fine sticking with my presumption here. But well, to me, you're right. Well, no, that presumption should be, why are we starting there? Why wouldn't we start with, let's say John six, just starting with what the text literally says. I think for many Protestants, they will say this John six can't mean what it sounds like because we don't have a sacramental priesthood. And so for me, I would say, well, maybe you should reconsider the necessity of the priesthood then. Well, it's uh, a lot of people find themselves reinventing the wheel and starting to add elements if they're not already Anglicans and, you know, in communions, which have this, you know, the magisterial Protestants lack a better term. Yeah. Now, let me talk about another sacrament that the scriptures say exists, but you just don't see it in the real world generally among Protestants. You know, and that's unction. You know, James 5, 14 to 15, is any one among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And so it seems to me a pretty obvious thing the scriptures talk about, which you almost never see anywhere. I'm going to presume maybe the Anglicans have it. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to guess that they do. Um, I know the Lutherans don't. So people know this sort of Baptist church my mother-in-law goes to. They actually have a bottle of olive oil and will do it. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere. But right. the list of my reasons is you don't find any Protestant sect really doing all of these things that the scriptures talk about. And that should concern people. Why don't they do all of these things? Yeah, and it, now, it's strange it's not universal. Like, you know, nearly all Protestants, except for like the Salvation Army, like practice baptism. They just they disagree what it means, but they will baptize. Um, or they'll do they'll offer communion. But it's it, the scripture seems very clear where it talks about this happening a lot that when people get sick, you receive unction, the anointing of the sick. And but you're right, that's th that and confession. Those are those are the rarities when they should be as common as baptism or, or communion. And I think just so Protestants watching this are aware that the because I, I actually don't know. You could you could let us know, Trent, um, how the Roman Catholics exactly do it. But I could tell you the Orthodox, the Orthodox still do healing with oil by default. Pretty much every Wednesday before Pascha, they do it. There's. Some that do it more frequently. Um, I knew a parish who would do it like once every three months that have an unction service. Um, there was actually a Roman Catholic parish where I grew up in Maypack, New York. Um, and I lived like three houses down. And they had a, a healing service every Thursday. And true story, it worked. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they probably just presumed I was Roman Catholic. I was only 16 at the time. Um, but that being said, I presume it was just blessed oil and not unction because it wasn't a priest each time. Right. But the point is, like, I, I at least in my limited experience, I've seen Roman Catholics trying to do this thing. And obviously they give unction when people are close to death. But um, let me ask you, Trent, is, does unction still exist among Roman Catholics just like when people are sick? Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of the 
and not just when people are sick, but the catechism says that the anointing of the sick uh, can also be given to people who uh, are going in, let's say, for like a major surgery. Uh, now, some people, some Catholics mistakenly think that it, anointing of the sick is only like when you're five minutes away from death. And that's not the case. It's for, for severe sickness, even for undergoing a major surgery. And the catechism is clear that the sacrament is efficacious in both uh, providing spiritual healing for a person and physical healing if it is God's will for that person, that if it is his plan for them, that through the oil they will they will be healed. Uh, but yeah, that seems very clear to me. And, and it is unfortunate you don't see a lot of these things. And of course, the counterpart being confirmation, the oil that strengthens after baptism. Um, not, not seeing that really in, in Protestantism either is unfortunate. Now, I'm going to try to stick in the sort of sacramental order, so I'm going to skip one of my bullet points. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned, for example, chrismation. Mm -hmm. You see in Acts 18, 8, 16 to 17, they don't receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles lay hands on them, even though after they've been baptized and everything in Samaria, if I remember right. Yeah. And Protestants don't do this. They'll they'll dunk people in water. There's there's no chrismation. It, it, it seems, again, to me, just – not doing everything the scriptures say. And this, one of my reasons being orthodox, I can actually go somewhere and see everything that's in the scriptures. Here, you know, here's a funny one. Speaking in tongues. Now, obviously, the Pentecostals have their version of speaking in tongues, though St. Irenaeus would call it demonic, uh, these the un, undecipherable languages. Um, but just so people aware, orthodox will regularly do litanies, read the scriptures, and do paschal greetings in multiple languages with known translations. And so you actually have, speaking in a different tongue, and a translation, what 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 talks about. And just so people know, this is not an American thing. You know, it, it's, for example, here's a tradition. You could watch the uh, the Moscow um, uh, paschal liturgy. Mm -hmm. And on Pascha, you try to find someone that can read a gospel passage in, a, in as many languages as possible. So obviously Moscow is a big city. They could have people like insane amount of languages. But when I was in Herkimer, or New York, we had Russian, Ukrainian, Slavonic, Bulgarian, Khmer, German, French, and English. That's eight languages. And so you could be in just Herkimer, or New York, and they're doing the same thing. So we actually do have speaking in tongues. And, you know, my apologies – yeah, we're reading the scriptures. We're, we're we're talking about real revelation in different languages. You know, we're we're saying Christ is risen in different languages. So it seems to me I could actually go somewhere and see legitimate speaking in tongues that no one appreciates outside the Orthodox communion because it's just not insane. It's just well, normal speaking other languages, right? But okay, so what is your understanding then of normally this would be called glossalia, uh, and it would be people moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, speaking a language that others don't understand. Because it seems to me that's what Paul is describing in, in Corinthians, and he gives uh, pres prescriptions for how to do that so people will not think that they've lost their minds. Because it does seem to me like speaking in tongues, because there are charismatic Catholics who do this, uh, that in many cases it does occur in a language people don't understand. Do you do you not agree with that? Or, or orthodoxy doesn't have a charismatic unit, so a, a movement, and so we would understand those to be decipherable languages. Now, this kind of gets to a later point um, that I'm going to make, but I'll just say briefly: we do believe that there's saints, like saints in living memory in the 20th century. I don't know who alive does this right now, but I'm sure they're out there. We believe there's saints that could converse in other languages that they don't know, and it could understand other languages they don't, don't know. And so we see this as a gift of interpretation and translation or the ability to actually speak a language you don't know. So it's always an actual human language. I see. Um, and, you know, it's just I, there's I, no charismatic that, unit. Yeah, movement. that would parallel to me what you're describing, the experience at Pentecost in Acts 2, where you preach and everybody under everyone understands their own native language. But uh, that to me, that's just what the point that I would add is I, I don't uh, discount glossalia. Um, I, I see that as having an, an ancient element there as well. But in any case, just a, a minor point. And, and I just want to bring up, because there's a comment here on the topic, 
that there's, I forget what it's called. I think they call it Yaya or something. There's this sort of, they sing the liturgy and then afterwards they just start continuing singing. But it's, it's just more like you start humming and you're kind of making up words. Uh, I think it's called mumble rap is a thing these days. It's kind of the Orthodox version in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's different. So people are conflating it. This, you know, it, it is a different thing. Okay. Um, it's Orthodox mumble rap perhaps, but anyway, um, again, we're, we're still not done with the Bible yet. The scriptures have ordination of the apostolic succession. But this doesn't exist at all within Protestantism, with perhaps the exception of the Anglicans. Now, what's Titus 1.5 say? I left you behind in Crete for this this reason, so that you should put in order what remained to be done and should appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so you have St. Paul appointing Titus and Titus appointing other people. If we're going to apply the regulative principle, that's apostolic succession. Well, well, it's interesting. The, the Bible never it never mm-hmm. describes someone becoming an elder or a bishop uh, by just assuming the office. I mean, think about it. How do you become a? How can you become a pastor? And let's say broad Protestantism, mere Protestantism. How do you become a pastor or an elder? Uh, well, you know, you get hired at a church, oftentimes. Uh, but another, but you can start your own. You can you can just say, "I am a pastor," by under your own authority to do that. But the Bible never lays out a direction for anyone to do that to ever in order to have pastoral authority in the church, you must receive it by having the laying on of hands uh, from others who have who have already received it, and they're instructed to not do so uh, in, a, in a hasty way. So I do think that it, it's, you know, it's problematic understanding church, because the letter to the Hebrews, it says, um, well, actually, here's what's funny. Okay. Uh, I was watching a, a video, I don't know, it was a dividing line a long time ago with James White. And he was he was talking to these Protestant guys who were off their rockers, basically. And they were criticizing him. He was at a live event and he was talking with them. And he asked them, he said, you know, who are you guys? Hebrews, I want to say it's Hebrews 13. It says, uh, submit to your elders for they've been placed with authority over you. And he asked them, who is your elder? And they said, Jesus is our elder. And James White just totally dismissed that. And he said, you got to be rooted in your local church. You can't be like these guys. I'm like, well, I don't think he's got a good foundation to to say something like that, really, when people can form their own authority by reading scripture and saying, I'm carrying out what scripture says, that you can't follow out what the Bible says. It doesn't say cling to a particular set of written documents that are canonical. Obey, submit to your elders. Ignatius of Antioch, follow the bishop. Uh, it's, it's completely foreign from you know modern Protestantism. And the the you not only have if they were really sola scriptura, they wouldn't ordain people apart from how the scriptures actually talk about it, like right ordination, apostolic succession. Right. Our first extra biblical document, First Clement, someone who's actually named in Philippians chapter four, so he's at least a pretty good authority on some stuff because he knew an apostle. Um, explicitly condemns self ordained leaders. Right. Explicitly condemns it. That that's our earliest. That's actually the whole point of of the letter. I mean, that's its topic. And so, we can imagine having not only a non biblical ecclesiology, but historically speaking, oh, you know, we have context from the fathers. As you know, a guy like Doctor Ortlund would say, he gets some sort of context from this. The first historical document that exists and likely predates even a few books of scripture explicitly condemns how he and so many of the Protestants are alleged religious leaders. That to me is very concerning. Why can't we just do what the scriptures say? Right. You know, my other proof text for this would be second Timothy two, two. Mm-hmm. And it says, and the things that you have heard from me, from many among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So literally our model in the scriptures is the doctrine of the apostles of St. Paul, Right is given to Timothy, and then Timothy is instructing that to give this to other faithful men. That is our model. It's not some guy alone in the woods with a Bible um, or some self-ordained pastor or just someone who learns to interpret things well. That is our model. You're supposed to get that information from someone with apostolic succession. That's what's actually in the scriptures. And the scriptures don't, because here's the other thing, if sola scriptura were true, and this goes back to 
uh, Protestants who say there's not enough biblical evidence for the papacy or apostolic succession. If Sola Scriptura were true, wouldn't we see the Bible talk about at least hinting towards there is going to be a future time when the scriptures will be the sole infallible rule of faith? Like, it amazes me that this is this is the formal principle of the Reformation. Uh, this is like a central pillar of Protestantism. Yet the biblical and historical evidence for Sola Scriptura is is scant, really. And I know there's people in the comments, what about, you know, I've got the three-volume, actually it's scattered amongst my bookshelves, the three volumes, <laughs> the King and Webster, th Holy Scripture, uh, their three-volume study in Sola Scriptura. But reading through that, I'm like, wow, you really have to mine like one Bible verse and a few apostolic fathers. I, honestly, that's why I have a lot of respect for someone like Gavin Ortland, who just says, yeah, we don't really see this clearly in Scripture. But I've noticed more Protestants making these kinds of logical arguments for sola scriptura trying to say it would just make sense that we would that we would have this kind of uh, authority but what's good for the geese good for the gander it's like okay i think that would make sense that god would give us uh his word in a written and unwritten form and that if he had covenants uh where you you know you have those who are, who are mediating for us it doesn't take away from christ being the one mediator but it seems clear that scripture continues that in the old covenant you had the high priest the ministerial priests and then you had the lay people christ is now the new high priest and we are the, the lay people a kingdom of priests but there's no reason to think the ministerial priesthood has been done away with and actually as you showed evidence in scripture that it's it's quite active now i'm going to kind of rapid fire somewhat some of these other other reasons mm -hmm. um from the scriptures um, in Orthodoxy, we could pray for the dead, like we see in 2 Timothy 1.16. We still have head coverings, like you read about 1 Corinthians 11. It's not completely in disuse, though, among the Greeks and the OCA, <laughs> there's issues. But it's it's still, there's still head coverings in Orthodoxy for women. Um, men still, for example, will remove their hats when reading the gospel and the consecration. Um I, this is important for me because we follow the scriptures in orthodoxy. There's no doctrine of no more miracles since the ending of inscripturation, which is just a totally made up doctrine, right? Like, you know, Protestants try to explain the reason uh, other than Pentecostals, we don't actually have people doing things like the saints do is because after inscripturation, which is the, of course a made up word, um, there is no more miracles. God is no longer speaking. We have everything we need in the scriptures, but Orthodox still have saints today that can interpret tongues, heal, read minds, tell the future, etc. And just so people know, because whenever you make these appeals of miracles, we must concede that many of these things when placed under scrutiny are not going to convince skeptics. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just saying Orthodox actually believe in the things the scriptures say happen are still happening. That's my point. We could believe we could take the scriptures at their word. Um, but I just think we should have humility because miracles tend not to be very convincing to outsiders. I'm only stating that Orthodox believe that they're real. And so let me give my conclusion on this topic. I can't think of anything the scriptures demand that the Orthodox do not do. But no Protestant does all of these things. In reality, though some on paper may do some of them or most of them, like maybe Anglicans or Pentecostals to some degree. And so what are the chances that orthodoxy is not the Christianity the apostles taught when we literally do everything that the apostles demand? I, I would I think that's a pretty basic criteria. So those are my comments on the issue of no Protestant sect really does everything the scriptures require. Um, Trent, you have anything to add or should we go on to the next topic? No, I think that I'll clarify that, you know, there are. It's common. I'm actually working on a book, another book on Protestantism. Then I have a chapter on B.B. Warfield's book, Counterfeit Miracles. There are Protestants who believe in continuationism, that miracles go up to the present day. And they're actually, I, I love their works because they call out the other camp, which are the cessationists, who say, mm -hmm. yeah, miracles are, were done in the first century. They'll say, first, if you just read the Bible, you wouldn't arrive at that conclusion. That it doesn't follow from Sola Scriptura at all, cessationism. Uh, and then number two, the Protestants who defend cessationism, like Warfield, 
their arguments against Catholic or Orthodox miracles are the same as the arguments that atheists make against biblical miracles. And that's going to go in my book that will come out soon when Protestants argue like atheists. I feel like they, they take this on a little bit. So I just wanted to add on your that point about uh, miracles. Well, thank you. Thank you for adding that because yeah, I think you're more steeped in apologetics about that stuff. I'm just giving, again, my personal reasons. But you're, I, you're, you're right. Th those Protestants who deny the the existence of who deny the existence of miracles uh after the apostolic age i really think that puts them in a bind that they have to say pentecostals orthodox and catholics are all are all demonic or something uh, now i don't believe that a miracle is proof of a sect having 100 percent correct theology it couldn't be i think there are legitimate miracles that some protestant groups reform you can find these within orthodox saints within catholic saints but I do think that, like, let's say God chooses to do a miracle through a Protestant pastor. That doesn't mean that he is affirming every single element of Protestant theology, because we in Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants do share important central elements of the Christian faith. But when these kinds of miracles are performed, let's say there's a Eucharistic miracle, uh, where the, the host becomes, the, the body, the li becomes literal flesh, or the miracle of Fatima, or something like that, then I think that points more towards, uh, and it's similar things you see in, in orthodoxy, for example, it definitely is a stronger endorsement of a theological apparatus that precludes a lot of Protestantism is how I would put it. And just, and just so people are aware the, the flavor or the kinds of miracles that are popular among Orthodox versus Roman Catholics tend to be visually different. Like, uh, just so Protestants aware, let's say, uh, like stigmata is a thing in Roman Catholicism. It doesn't exist in Orthodoxy. Uh, weeping icons is a thing in Orthodoxy. Roman Catholics have a kind of different version. It's like usually statuary uh, sometimes. Uh, do they have myrrh? I know there's blood, but, you know, they have weeping versions of stuff as well. A little bit, yeah. Um, I don't know of a Catholic counterpart to the, the miracle of the fire in Orthodoxy. Uh, the 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 fire in um, in Jerusalem that that's another one that I think would be unique there. But uh, you're you're right. There are certain, and I think that lends itself towards that if God does miracles, uh, they will be uh, culturally appropriate for people to understand the power of it. So if you have, let's say, a Latin stigmata, would make more sense in a Latin community that has more of a devotion uh, to an an understanding of that in in its art or, or piety versus uh, other things let's say if a miracle occurs in orthodoxy it might be more in accord with the piety and cultural practices of that area so that could be a whole video on its own it's kind of like a third rail actually and th this is not about things roman catholics orthodox are different on so i'm going to press forward <laughs> and reason number two why i'm not pressing it schism is a sin and i don't have to pretend that it's not serious all right and so whenever we see schism talked about in the scriptures, it's always bad. So it seems like, all right, if something's bad in the scriptures, we should consider this actually bad. So in 1 Corinthians 1.10, if you read the New King James Version, and they have uh, the little headings for the passages, which are obviously not originally in the scriptures. It's just the translation, the publication's opinion of what the passage is about. And so this, the verse I'm about to read is in a passage that is called sect sectarianism is sin. All right. And so 1 Corinthians 1.10 states, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no schisms among you. All right. So the problem that Paul is imagining not to do, these schisms, is sectarianism. Now, in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, and, and this is the passage that converted me to orthodoxy. I think maybe I'm the only person in history that read this passage and, and, and converted, right. <laughs> converted him. But this is the passage that converted me to orthodoxy. And St. Paul writes, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. So, so far, lots of bad stuff, right? Selfish ambitions, dissensions, usually translated the next one is heresies, but some people know the Greek word literally is sex. All right, it's S E C T S. I don't know how my microphone brings up that word. Envy, murders, 
drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that to me sounds like a big deal, right? We got to be treating this issue like it's a big deal. There is no denial that in all first century sources, explicit on the question, they render heresies as sects, including Acts of the Apostles. And so where there's any unambiguous mention of the Greek word, it's always as sect, all right? You can read it in Philo and Josephus and whatnot. That, that's how the word was used. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting being that etymology, the study of the nature of words, in the first century, some would say, well, this is clearly what it meant in the first century. Dr. Orla makes an argument, and because we had it in the, the show, um, why are you Orthodox slash Protestant? Mm -hmm. And he argues that he can infer a different meaning in the Pauline epistles exclusively because they're not specific enough in, deline in delineating that sects are spoken of, which mm -hmm. to me is sort of strange because in Acts of the Apostles, it's unequivocal, and in Philo, it's unequivocal. And so uh, and Josephus. And so, all right, it's unequivocal everywhere. And so where it's just not specific enough, I'm going to prefer the interpretation that it cannot be um, sect. And it, it must just mean heresy, which is a, a later meaning of the word. Right. So to jump in to clarify here, what you're saying is that Paul is saying here, he's condemning the sin of schism, which would be not giving proper recognition of authority, not yielding or submitting to a proper Christian authority. It's and that some people try to obscure the passage by saying, well, he's talking about heresy. Now, of course, Catholics define the terms differently, so I'm gonna try to make it broad. Schism is not submitting to proper authority. Heresy is refusing to believe or believing in contradiction to doctrine that Christians must believe. So it seems like Dr. Ortland and others could say, well, yeah, we believe the right doctrine. That's what he's talking about here. And I'll let you continue, but just to make sure. And, and, it's, and by good. the way, it's good not to believe in wrong doctrines. Right. <laughs> so so we'd agree with him. But the question is, what was St. Paul actually saying? If we right. just went by the simplest etymological answer, it'd be sectarianism is that damnable sin, which those who do such, who right. practice such, and not inherit the kingdom of God. And now, it's, not, it's, not merely, it's not merely that they believe false doctrine. It's that by refusing to submit to the proper authorities in the church, that will lead them to things like false doctrine. But I think when you look at the context of the passage here, uh, what what he is saying is that people are engaged in in not virtuous conduct or, or vices, vicious conduct, uh, and that their emotions are preventing them from giving this, this proper submission. And to me, the context, especially the historical context, when you look at Clement or Ignatius, that this was a problem in the church, and that's what's going on here. And it's important because, as you're pointing out, the things in all this is conduct. There's parts of the scripture where um, they're emphasizing, um, I don't know, the thought life. But here it's all about how we're treating others. I mean, just look at the words around the word sects, right? Selfish ambitions, dissensions. In the Greek, that's dichotomos, by the way, where we get the Greek word dichotomy. So dissensions, like literal divisions between people, sects, and envy, right? So these all imply divisions due to selfishness or chauvinism, like hatred of our fellow man, not doctrinal differences specifically. So this kind of translation of the word sect to be loaded to be heresy the way we will speak about it in general conversation today, to me, doesn't do justice to the immediate context of the actual passage, let alone the etymology of the term in the first century. Mm. But let's just for the sake of argument say that Dr. Ortlund and other Protestants, because I feel they'd be compelled to, um, they're rendering the passage as heresy, not as sect, um, is, you know, a, at least intellectually respectable. I'd say, is it a morally safe to to then not think sectarianism is this dangerous sin based upon that inference that it's, this is a respectable inference and to deny the simpler reading. I don't think that's morally safe. And I think third, I want to make the point, is it morally safe to deny the explicit teaching of every single Christian author on this subject in the early church 
with the exception of Tyconius, who, by so people know, he was a schismatic off the Donatist, who were schismatics. Mm -hmm. So, right, this is right. It would make sense. Tyconius would teach the Invisible Church doctrine in, in his uh, commentary on the Book of Revelation. But is it safe that to affirm to not believe this is a big deal when every other single author on this topic thought it was a big deal? And I want to point out, like I referred to before, this includes Saint Clement of Rome a first century source who knew St. Paul, who stated concerning those in schism, he says in chapter 59, they will involve themselves in transgression and serious danger. And he says, those therefore who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to his will, when he's speaking of schism, are punished with death, First Clement 41. So this seems to me a big deal. And as we point out before, the people in schism in Corinth, this wasn't, they weren't Gnostics. This wasn't, all, you know, they were super zany or whatever. They were just not ordained. They weren't ordained properly. That's why Clement speaks of apostolic succession. Right. That's the whole context behind it. And so punished by death, serious danger, this sounds like serious stuff. So we must note that who would understand the meaning of Galatians 5 better? Us in the 21st century or someone who knew Paul? Right. I, I, I'm going with someone who knew Paul. I really think Protestants have no good response to the issue of schism, and they often, I presume, not deliberately misrepresent the fathers on this question. Now, let me give you an opportunity maybe to add anything if you'd like to, Trent. No, I, I think what I— Because yeah. now we're going to uh, poor Dr. Ortlund. You know, God bless him, I want to say this. He, I, I believe, has overtaken James White as the standard bearer of anti-Catholic Orthodox apologetics and gave to the fathers. And that means something. I think otherwise James White is the – was the go-to guy. And so all these things I, I will are say this. I, <laughs> I find it – well, I mean I, I really enjoyed the recent exchange I had with Dr. Ortland. I We are planning to have future exchanges. Uh, I and uh, He brings a very Irenic – quality and an academic rigor to his uh, critiques of Catholicism. And so I, I think that that's very, that's very good for all of us to, to arrive at the truth. So that's why I always look forward to seeing a new video from his that's offering a perspective on, on something like Catholicism or, or things like that. Yeah, he uh, makes so, great so, videos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then the other point you're raising about schism, I think it's important here is to first to ask our Protestant brothers and sisters, all right, what is the sin of schism? Let's define it. It's not heresy. Schism refers to the sinful rejection of authority, not the sinful rejection of doctrine. It's the sinful rejection of following a particular authority. All right. So uh, an, a, a authority within the church. And if we agree, okay, scripture is clear. It, it recognizes schism. It says it's a serious sin. Then my next question would be, as a product, is it possible to be in the sin of schism if you're a Protestant. I just don't think it is if what you believe that your authority is Scripture. Now, like, well, I have other authorities. I have my pastor. I have this or that. Yeah, but you can always end up saying, I, I follow my pastor except when he contradicts Scripture, or I follow my church and its articles except when it contradicts Scripture. So you always have an out where you can say that you're, you know, you're, you're, true allegiance is to scripture alone not to these other human authorities now, i know there's gonna be ones who say well no and anglicanism lutheranism i know that they say that they have splits too though right that you can that you it's not considered sinful um even among in anglicanism look at all of the different churches and offshoots uh, even even within that i don't think it's if we recognize schism as a sin the bible condemns it but I don't think that within Protestantism, it, it's not schism, it's forming a new community, basically. It's, it, it, I just don't think it's possible to actually fall into the sin of schism, because you don't recognize any of these other authorities, human authorities within the body of Christ, you have to be loyal to. It's, just, it's scripture alone, and I think that's, that's the problem. And you're, you're stealing my thunder, because we will cover that. <laughs> <laughs> the... Um... I do want to reply to um, something Dr. Ortlund uh, said because I made a categorical statement that every every Christian writer on this topic, other than Diconius, right, that's explicitly writing about um, schism, says, "Yeah, this is a damnable, horrible sin." 
and thought that Orla claims that Augustine teaches that those outside the church can be saved. And it, like I said, it demands those who aren't just going to say the fathers are wrong, someone like James White, um, that it demands, I feel, misinterpreting the fathers. Again, not deliberately so, but taking right. stuff out of context. So like Dr. Ortlund, for example, says, oh, I read something in book five, I think chapter 27 of On Baptism Against the Donatists, which says, you know, nice stuff about people among in the Donatist communion. And so that means there's salvation outside the church. Schism's not this horrible deal breaker. And I just want to point people to the discussion to the Caesarean Church in paragraph six, because this is, a, this, to me, a categorical statement from St. Augustine. And St. Augustine says, he can do everything outside the Catholic Church except salvation. He can have honor. He can have sacraments. He can sing hallelujah. He can say amen. He can hold the gospel. He can have faith and preach in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But nowhere can he find salvation except in the Catholic Church. So it seems to me like how do you take this kind of vaguer passage from Augustine saying good things about Adontis, but ignore when, when St. Augustine directly addresses the question, says, no, there's only salvation within the Catholic Church. Now, I want to point to people the one other passage. And the reason I'm, I want to almost build up the credibility, like when I make the statement that schism is categorically among all the early church writers as this damnable sin, I'm not saying this lightly. I mean, this is serious stuff. And so let's take another passage from St. Augustine from the same book that Dr. Ortlund was citing. It's on baptism against the Donatists. This is book one, chapter three. And I wish I remember reading it and I forgot the passage. And it's like right in the beginning. Look what St. Augustine says. He says, if anyone were compelled by urgent necessity, being unable to find a Catholic from which to receive baptism. So obviously he's talking about a catechumen, right? Because it's someone looking for baptism, then they're, they're not yet baptized. And so while preserving Catholic peace in his heart, should receive from one without the pale of Catholic unity, the sacrament which he was intending to receive within its pale, right? So this catechumen was intending to become baptized a Catholic. This man, should he immediately depart this life, we deem to be none other than a Catholic. But if he should be delivered from the death of the body, on his restoring himself in bodily presence to that Catholic congregation, which in heart he had never departed, so far from blaming his conduct, we should praise it with the greatest truth and confidence. And so this clearly shows when St. Augustine's talking about these exceptions of salvation outside the church, he's talking about people that are faith, faithful Catholics. Right, faithful Orthodox. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's someone who was a catechumen in the Catholic Church for whatever reason. He's traveling or something. He's cut off. It's like I might die. I'm going to get baptized because just so people know, we have saints that baptize themselves. Right, like it's uh, Saturinus, for example. Saint Ambrose talks about baptize himself. It's a kind of pious thing. We're not going to say it's good and you should do it, mm -hmm. but the point is, it's pious for a saint to seek baptism when they, it feels like they can't get it from anywhere. That, that's what you see in the hagiographies. And so would you consider someone like a thief on the cross or a Christian martyr that's not yet baptized or, or something like that, or someone who's in a shipwreck like Saturinus and he's a faithful Christian who's not yet baptized, are they out of the church because they haven't yet received the sacrament yet? And the answer the church always gives is no, because in the heart they have faith in Christ and they have love for the church. Right. It's a complete package, right? They have love for Christ's body. And so to say, all oh, these exceptions exist in Augustine's, that means he believes in salvation outside of the Catholic Church, not only puts into dispute Augustine's literal words, it says there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. When we see Augustine's actual explanation of how this works, what you see is someone who's spiritually a Catholic. Right. And so I really have to think, people have to ask themselves this when they're reading the fathers, when they see something they don't like, like schism's a sin. It's not that big a deal. It's not really a sin. It's not that big a deal or whatever. The sort of reinterpretations of statements from the fathers, like did Augustine really say salvation is only in the Catholic church? They really sound to me like Satan speaking, right? What did Satan say? What's the first lie in the scriptures? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Right? Of course that's what God said. Of course that's what the saints said. If we have to say, well, did they really say it? Well, what's the spirit behind that? Is that is that a spirit from God or is that demonic? And, and I think 
This sort of blatant reinterpretation of something so obvious in Augustine's writing indicates the work of the demonic, in my honest opinion. Now, th this is nothing personal to Ortlund or anyone who does this, because all false doctrines come from demons. You know, sure. Satan's the father of lies. You know, you and I, Trent, we disagree upon many doctrines because we're in different communions. So ultimately, one of us is wrong, <laughs> one of us is demonically deceived about this or that. Yeah, and we're, and we're but, but I think what, what this is showing, though, and that's why this is actually a project. I'm. It's so funny. I'm. I'm right now in the midst of essentially. I have three books that I'm that I'm juggling. One is a second edition of my pro life book. It's almost done because of the Dobbs decision. Book on Protestantism. And another book on liberal Catholicism. I hope we get all. I want all of those to be done in about a month or so because I really want to do a deep dive on the question of were the early church fathers Protestant. Uh, because you had people like Dr. Ortland and others, uh, when I've read their monographs and other books, who, because I, we see this, I think a lot of, like, easily, like, one of the most common reasons you hear, either you've probably heard of somebody becoming, or, you mentioned this earlier, someone becoming Orthodox, or when I hear someone become Catholic, it's, I read the Fathers, and they don't sound Protestant to me. Mm -hmm. Not even that they sound Catholic or Orthodox, but that they just, they do not sound Protestant. And so... I think Protestants have woken up to that criticism and have gone to the fathers with, I think, very creative readings of, of them. And, I, and I'm glad that you pointed this out with the example of Augustine and, and others. Uh, that's why I want to do a deep dive in that, that at the very least, I would say, no, you're not going to, you know, it, it would be uh, I, like, I'll give you an example. Like, I, I honestly, I don't have a desire to debate the, the papacy with a Protestant. Because we are already so like you and I could have a discussion about the papacy because we already have so much in common. We already recognize apostolic succession, the role of the patriarchs, the role of the bishop. We can actually get down to the nitty gritty. But if I'm trying to debate someone who does who doesn't even believe that there's something like an authoritative bishop, much less that he's the pope, you know, I have hardly I've hardly any room to go, you know, with this individual. But Trent, you could get so many clicks. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, so that's because that's ultimately what matters, right? Uh, so, but that's why. So, for me, like the question, like with the fathers, like it's, I mean, it's, it would be something that's very meticulous to sort out with, with vocabulary and history, let's say, where you and I might disagree with Catholicism and Orthodoxy. But to me, when I just try to establish Reformation Protestantism and especially modern Protestantism, looking back at the fathers, it really is like, like night and day to me. And, and there are some who want, and that's why I'm very surprised at Dr. Ortland because he has more, he comes from more of a low church Calvinist Baptist tradition to find that antiquity in the fathers, I, I think is, is a stretch, but he does so with, with rigor and it does demand a, a, a reply. So I know he's working, I believe he's working on a book right now, summarizing everything he's kind of done on his YouTube channel and things like that. Very eager for him to write that because I'd love to read it and other books to give a reply just on that one question. It's sadly for people, we're not yet done. <laughs> the issue of a schism. Oh. Now, you did refer to this before, Trent. Yeah, yeah. And it was the issue of what can, by the Protestant definition, ever qualify a schism in the real world? In yeah. the real world, right? If an elder or some other prominent figure leaves James White's or Dr. Ortlund's or Father James from Barely Protestant leaves their church and literally opens a Bible church right across the street and takes half the congregation with them, they might not be happy, but none of them would seriously consider this schismatic and they're going to hell over this. And so it's just like you referred to before, there just seems to be no real criteria. And so this leads me to this conclusion. If this whole way of thinking, Protestantism, has removed all force from the sin, which the scriptures outright condemn, which the fathers outright condemn, then the only thing we can conclude is that they are guilty of it and they don't want to owe up to it, right? It, it kind of reminds me like Matthew Vines. I don't know if he's still a thing. He he was like the gay Protestant, the gay Christian thing yeah. back in the day. I don't know if he's still doing it anymore or if he even no. identifies as a Christian anymore. But if people follow Matthew Vines, he'd make these arguments from the Greek that the, the Greek really wasn't condemning um, uh, monogamy and homo uh, or condemning, condemning polygamy. Sex matter, trafficking and, uh, and pederasty. Yeah, you know, and, and stuff like that. Like, you know, homosexuality is really not a sin. And so 
it's clear when people are guilty of that sin, they generally will then redefine the sin so that they're not guilty of it anymore because we're, we're always justifying ourselves. We rarely will say, well, man, man, I really am screwing up here. And so to me, if, if prosthetism has no actual functional definition application of how do we avoid schism, then this seems to me to, con- to show pretty conclusively it's because they're guilty of it. That's just basic yeah. common sense. That's interesting. And, and so that that's my last comment on the issue. I don't know if you have any, Trent. No, I think that's great. So here's my last issue, which is which I think is important. In in I can't be Protestant Protestant because within Protestantism, I cannot honor the saints. I would have to think they're almost all wrong. You know, that to me is a big deal. It just feels to me wrong in my gut that the people that like actually bequeath to us the multiple biblical canons, which tend to be around 66 books according to one, 73 and the other, but pretty much they gave us their canon. They wrote down the scriptures because there weren't printers back then and photocopiers. So like we're actually depending upon these people to give us our Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. But yet we have to think they're this horrible with everything. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, think about what Protestant, legitimate, pro- especially evangelical, non-denominational, because I think many of them, sadly, they they might, if they're historically ignorant, would write off as saints. But those who really do look to history, and that starts you down the path towards an apostolic communion like uh, Catholicism or Orthodoxy, looking at the witness of the lives of the saints. But if you're Protestant, you have to say, yeah, but these people worship the Eucharist, which in your theology would make them idolaters, engaged in necromancy if they ask for they. Uh, seek the intercession of the saints uh that they they accepted writings as being inspired that actually were not like the deuterocanonical books of scripture or the other books in the orthodox canon that they well that that they were you know flagrantly um wrong about the nature of scripture all you're right that you would if you you, it's kind of like the lord liar lunatic trilemma with um jesus right you know is he He's either lying about being God, but he's so virtuous. He's either a lunatic, but he's so wise. He's got to be who he who he says he is. So the saints, they're either these charlatans or heretics or demonic, or they really were filled with with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it seems to me something that is insurmountable, honestly. You know, I can actually, as you know, as a president. I'd actually have to n- not care that all the fathers are addressing the question that schism is a sin, um, or they inferred a literal canonical boundaries to the church, so there are people there in and out. You know, I'd have to just not care whether that's the case. You know, I'm happy that I can actually care that no fathers taught forensic justification, right? Which honest and reformed Protestants admit. So, right, like if you're Protestant, you have to just not care about it. Then, you know, it doesn't matter. They didn't teach it. It's so Protestants are actually honest and will say, well, they, they right off the bat, Clement and Ignatius just clearly did not emphasize the gospel as they put it. Instead of saying, well, maybe the way we're delivering the gospel is incorrect. Now there are, are Protestants that simply call the saints wrong on this or that issue, which, are, which to me is very impious. I didn't like this as a, as a Protestant. I'd say as a Protestant, if you show me this from the fathers, I'll believe it. And, you know, lo and behold, I, I converted. But for the record, there are some Orthodox and Catholics, usually when there's something they can't show from the fathers, will say, yeah, the saints are wrong or this saint is wrong. And this, to me, is an obvious Protestant post-Enlightenment tendency. It's something we should avoid. Again, these are my reasons for yeah. not being Protestant. Because I don't feel comfortable just calling people that are saints just wrong. You know, I, I consider it impious. Well, I mean, well, we I, do have to be careful. They're not infallible. So, I mean, that you know, but I think especially, so for me, it would be more the wholesale rejection of the fathers and the saints that Protestantism ends up entailing. Um, that's where on my end, I would, I would think things are very problematic. The... I would say the Orthodox versus even the Catholic treatment of saints is a little bit different and nuanced, but mm-hmm. we could that's a that's another discussion. <laughs> the See, it's I, not I, fun for us to talk about Protestantism unless the differences creep up between us every now and then. But <laughs> but but, that, but that's what's funny for to me though, is like I know the other Paul, I haven't had a chance to watch his video yet. 
it's like a full time job just watching every trying to watch what everybody else is doing, even when it's on double time speed to like keep up with everybody's arguments and, and this or that. That he tries to say, well, no, you know, if you compare Sola Scriptura and the lack of unity among Protestants, you need to compare what he calls ecclesialism, uh, the idea of a magisterial authority or tradition authority, and the the differences in doctrine there. And I agree there are differences, but to me, I think anyone would like if you compared you and I and our doctrinal agreements and differences to me and Gavin Ortland, or you and Gavin Ortland, or James White, or N.T. Wright, even, or somebody like that. I think when people look, they would find way more agreement between us than as you go further out on the web towards towards Protestants. Uh, so I, I do think that it's uh, it, it's stark in the differences. And 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 as you infer, the the reasoning behind that would be because common roots and common authorities. Right. The um, now there are some Protestants which I find kind of speak out of both sides of their mouth to say the saints are wrong or they don't suit their needs, but otherwise, but yeah, we really honor should heed what these um, saints teach. And I think that just so people have a good grasp of this is the magisterial Protestants claimed, for example, versus Roman Catholics at the time to better represent the saints, right? Like you don't really see Protestants making that argument anymore that they're more authentically following what the saints teach than Roman Catholics, or they seem to have given up on that. Yeah. And so like there's sort of vestiges of this tendency, like every Protestant wants to own Augustine other than the Arminians, right? Like they're, they're not going to say Augustine's in hell, the reform, for example, but it seems to me that the verdict of history has turned so starkly against yeah. Protestants that more and more of them are just comfortable like James White or the other Paul just say, flat out saying they're ignorant or wrong. Well, Augustine, that's funny. So B.B. Warfeld, a 19th century, or late 19th, early 20th century, I believe, Protestant, uh, Calvinist theologian, he said of Augustine that Augustine's theology, uh, paraphrasing, he said Augustine's theology of grace conquered his theology of the church. And so what Warfeld is a Calvinist say, I love Augustine on grace, but I can't stand everything he says, like what we're talking about now is schism and the role of the church. So you're right. It is, it's, it is fascinating. I sometimes wonder what Augustine, they're reading about soteriology, because you have Eucharistic uh, commemoration that liberate people from hell and stuff. Right. I'm like, wait, Protestants don't do that. But St. Augustine talks about it uh, yeah. explicitly in the handbook of faith, hope, and love. So it's, yeah, it's these great one-liners, which like you say, they show this honor for Augustine and, but it, I think to James White credit to other Paul and some others, when they just say, yeah, the saints are wrong, they just didn't understand the Greek well enough, they syncretized real early, they're being more intellectually honest for their own tradition. doesn't mean they're correct, obviously, but at least they're saying we can't own these saints and really believe what they say because they're utterly inconsistent with our traditions. And that's why, like you point out earlier, that evangelicalism is sort of post magisterial Protestant version of Protestantism is really has nothing in common with the original version of Protestantism. Like original Protestantism wasn't low church. It was sacralist. There were state churches, Dutch reformed. Um, you know, Scotland was uh, reformed. Germ, you know, Northern Germany, Scandinavia is Lutheran. You know, they were state churches, just like they were state Roman Catholic churches before that. Then they became state Protestant churches. It's, Protestantism, the fact that it's changed shows that, well, what changed with losing its sacralism is its connection with saints that would have thought nothing bad about there being a state church. And the saints have nothing in common with evangelicalism. You just don't find any hint of this whatsoever. So I think that being Protestant ultimately demands rejecting the saints and finding what they believed objectionable, even though for centuries Christians fully embraced their writings and affirmed their teachings. So – that's why I feel I can't be Protestant because it would require pretty much just discarding the saints, the people that actually give you the scriptures, the people that actually gave us the Christian religion. You know, the Christian religion didn't come from the 21st century. It was preserved for 20 centuries. And so I, I feel you would have to almost have this great apostasy theory in order to be a Protestant. Even those who say, I don't really believe that. Well, functionally they do. They have to. I just don't see their alternative. Yeah. Um, I think when you see these hard things in saints, it's important to keep this in mind. The scriptures have difficult saints. It's like the saints have difficult saints. Right. Right. And like the ones you'll see on the atheist Bible, if that thing still exists, 
like, yeah. you know, uh, parts of scriptures that talk about dashing the heads of infants on rocks. And then if you read the saints, they'll say this has to do with the passions or thoughts that we're always, you know, submitting every thought to Christ. And in, in that sense, we're dashing infants on rocks. And so obviously this is a scandalous statement that they interpreted it typologically like that, right? That we're not talking about literally smashing baby heads. But the saints, for example, made these other difficult teachings, but no one found these scandalous. So like to quote St. Cyprian in letter 54, paragraph 24, he who is not in the church of Christ is not a Christian. That's what he's saying to schismatics, that there's a sense in which they're not Christians. And you think of, well, this is so scandalous, should be reinterpreted, that someone would have done so before Luther, but no, because everyone took him at his word. This is what everyone believed. Mm -hmm. So statements as the preceding, preceding have been faithfully preserved. They've been reiterated. They've never been corrected or twisted to mean something else. And so to me, it's we got to accept this from the saints, and so if we honor the saints, then we got to accept these teachings. We have no indication that these anti-Protestant teachings would have been something that there was some sort of resistance against among any legitimate Christians. So I think it seems to, it, it seems to me morally dangerous to be Protestant, the fact that they dishonor the saints. And I keep saying morally dangerous because I can't offer the listener epistemic certainty within this hour and a half, two hour video that everything we say is right. They're going to have to do their own research, but I can say, well, I can't give you certainty, but I can say, well, the fact that what I'm saying has, you're going to omit some element of truth. You're going to have to look into it. Then there is a moral component. So yeah. if you can never know all the facts, you can't read everything. Then you have to say, well, what's the moral danger for me continuing this in this way? Because there's no pro precedent for Protestantism. So let me put this in a real lame, low IQ way. Protestantism equals unprecedentism, right? There's just no precedent for it. If you want to know what it is, it's embracing this belief system without precedent. The, the reformers with less or limited access to sources would never own this label. They would never say the saints are wrong. They would never say that um, that it's okay that we disagree with the saints and they knew less than we do today. They, it appears that anyone dealing honestly with the primary sources – would have to be like James White and not like the magisterial Protestants. And I'm just not comfortable being an unprecedentist. I, I believe we need precedent for our beliefs or they're not legitimate. And so those would be my concluding remarks on why sure. I'm not Protestant. And Trent, let me give it to you and also give opportunities to the audience to ask some questions. Yeah, I'll just briefly add on to that. Uh, I liked it the way you, you framed it there because for me, I mean, I try not to make like a kind of a simple gotcha argument against protestantism per se but what i want to look at is what i would call historical pedigree uh, so i very carry very much that if the deposit of faith was given by christ to the apostles that we should see and, and I'm, i and i subscribe of course to cardinal henry newman's view of, of doctrinal development i think everybody has to agree that doctrine develops and that does not just newman that goes all the way back to saint vincent of lorenz in the, in the fifth century you know <laughs> Uh, uh, when you, when I look at the fathers and then the saints, uh, you know, they're not mutually exclusive, obviously, but you look at the holy men and women of God in the church going back, I would want to see, all right, from the deposit of faith, do we see a nice, even progression and understanding of, of these practices? Are we just going to quote Christology at Ephesus, but we're not going to quote the Mariology at the council of Ephesus, you know? Am I seeing this nice progression of doctrine? I feel like when I one reason I'm not Protestant is that I see more honestly looking at the history, and I think many other Protestants will agree with this. At best, you have a very thin thread, and it's like the Cambrian explosion in the fossil record. It's like this thin thread, and then in the 16th century, you you get everything kind of um, exploding out. That to me is indicative of much less of a historical pedigree than I would be comfortable with than what I would see in something like an apostolic communion, be it orthodoxy or, or Catholicism. On your point about schism, though, I want to add one other element is, what about the issue of excommunication? Paul does this in 1 Corinthians 5 with the man who's sleeping with his stepmother. Uh, you know, the Bible makes it clear, bring a brother sinned against you, bring him to the church. So I think it's uh, Matthew 18. Bring him to the church as your last resort. So it seems like the church has authority to send people out of the church, hand them over to Satan 
as a medicinal punishment. But in Protestantism, you get booted from one church, you walk down the street to another. You don't, you don't really, ha you can't really have that authoritative structure to cut someone off for their own good, essentially. So that be that might be another point you might file under schism and excommunication going with that. And the same with Matthew chapter 18. Protestants are fond of saying we're two or three uh, uh, agreeing my name there in the midst of them, but that's in reference to church discipline. <laughs> when when disciplining um, those that are going to be excommunicated from the church. And like you said, if there's no practical application for where when schism really exists or excommunication really exists, that seems to me to show it's because they are excommunicate. It's because they are in schism. Oh, why else do they have no practical application for these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can go to we can go to questions. Obviously, if anybody has. Any. All right. So, guys, this you have Chen Horn on, and so take <laughs> advantage of this because you could always hear me answer questions, but not always Chen Horn on this channel. So, let me scroll up, and we have a few. We won't. Kill you because now that I'm running out of battery on this computer, I forgot yeah. my charger. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably have to. I'll probably have to head home here in a second. But yeah, we can take a few. So we'll do three questions with Trent. Sure. We have Trent. Is it possible the Protestants have been existing since the first century? Yeah. Oh, there is a a book. I want to say the Trail of Blood. What is it? Oh no, it's um. Well, no, that's the tract relating to it. Yeah, there, there are claims that are maybe like this. One group that makes this are Baptist secessionists. And so they'll claim that you can always find Christians who believe Protestant theology going back to the first century. And they'll say the heretics throughout church history, like the Waldensians, uh, the Novationists, uh, all these heretics throughout church history, they were actually Protestants that were being persecuted. But that's a terrible argument because when you go back to those those heretical groups, they either don't believe Protestant doctrines or they believe heresies related to Gnosticism that Protestants reject today. A good book that uh, refutes that is Baptist Secessionism, uh, a, a, a crucial question in Baptist history by James Edward McGoldrick. Called, so Baptist Secessionism by McGoldrick uh, puts that to rest. Yeah, I was very surprised that Dr. Ortlund even uh, use the kind of pre-crypto Protestant, pre-proto Protestant argument. Yeah. Um, because like they had uh, the Eucharist, they had confession, they had extreme asceticism. It's like this stuff that they don't believe. And like you really, it, it just it seemed to me pretty bizarre, honestly. And without that, con especially that he's published in like medieval, like with Anselm and stuff. It's like it was a it was a surprising argument, um, which is pretty easily falsifiable. Um, we have uh, a question for both of us, but you can answer first, Trent. In your experience, what makes a Protestant that is aware of church history remain Protestant? Well, I mean, you would have to you have to ask them. I, I think for many of them, uh, it results in a redefinition of many of the terms that they'll find in the fathers and a very elastic sense of what counts as history, that they, they have a very high tolerance for Catholic and Orthodox practices going back, not thinking that they should extend today, and uh, a very high tolerance. They're, they're willing to overlook more paucity or scarcity of evidence for the antiquity of Protestant doctrines. But I think it'll ultimately come up to a person's own predispositions and interpretive framework that they use and how it's how that's kind of dialed in i've seen two things um and and i'm speaking of real people by the way mm -hmm. they either are very learned and they just come to the conclusion nothing squares perfectly like take a real myopic topic like the original practice was maintaining relics whole and not moving them from where they were mm -hmm. right you know this might blow some people's minds but now in Orthodoxy, this is I, – I, maybe Roman Catholics do this, but much less. Like you could still see like tons of full bodies in the Vatican and stuff like that. The um, the Orthodox is willy-nilly just – you know they'll pretty much break into pieces the saints and and give a little relic to every – to uh, to all different churches and put them right. in icons, put them on altars. And – not only so now you're not only you're breaking the relic up and you're moving it from what originally was. 
And so like when people get to these kind of like really myopic topics, they're like, well, then no one's totally right. So I guess I'll just stare yeah. where I am. Well, it's kind um, of a relativism. It's it's sort of like, and I've heard James White say this. He'll say, look, when it comes to the church fathers, the church fathers are not Catholic. They're not Orthodox. They're not Protestant. They are the church fathers. And so it's a kind of relativism where you can say, yeah, my theology doesn't connect with the fathers and the saints, but nobody else does either. And, it, and I would say, well, sure, no one exactly does, but it seems like the trajectory is, is thicker and better accounted for in some ecclesial traditions than others. Just because no one is 100% like the father, just like among the fathers, you're not going to find 100% identical orthodoxy and orthopraxy between Ignatius of Antioch and St. John of Damascus or something like that. But the question is, which traditions are at least closer or far closer? That if you try to relativize it, well, nobody exactly matches, so everything is fine. That That's relativism. Some are closer than others and should be stro striven after, strove after. And the uh, the other also is people will, I know Protestants that could read themselves in the church. They're convinced all the arguments, but they, they attend and it just feels like an alien experience. Like it's hard to love saints that you have no relationship with. Right. It's hard to feel the do practices that feel foreign to you. Like, let's say you're never used to kneeling. You went to the rock star church or you're not used to kissing icons. You're I'm just going to even though my wife doesn't have this issue. She's Cambodian. They don't even kiss in that country. Right. right. So now you're asked to kiss this picture and you're not even used to kissing. So that could take people that are um, otherwise intellectually convinced, but they feel they just feel they can't stick with it. They feel like they start spiritually dying. Yeah. And uh you know, that's, I guess, a personal issue, which I can't so much address. All right, by mistake, clicked in the last question. So here we go, Trent. This is for you. Why use sacraments to determine whether all the other doctrines are true? If Baptists are right about immersion or plunging, would that mean they are right about others? Well, okay. So, yeah, I guess the question here is, if you are right about something that everybody else is wrong about, then that would mean your theology is correct. And on the one hand, that kind of argument makes sense. Like if if someone if a religion says Christ did not rise from the dead, I know that religion is false, uh, even if uh, I don't even have to look at the other doctrines. So I know Islam is false. I know Hinduism is false uh, because they deny something I know is true, that Christ rose from the dead. The argument here seems to be, you know, well, what about like Baptists? If they are right about, the necessity of immersion for salvation, then doesn't that mean that, you know, that they are right? Well, that would only prove that if that is true, that immersion is necessary for valid baptism, that would, that would only prove that traditions that teach this are, are correct. Um, and I don't know the exact how much, I know the Orthodox traditionally do immersion. I don't know if they allow tolerance for any other, methods right off the top of my head uh so I, I see the arguments going i would just deny it's it's minor premise uh so like, yeah i know that people who deny that christ is present in the eucharist their their theology is going to be incorrect because i know that that's true but i would deny the minor premise that i would say that while immersion is the most purest is the what's we're looking for here is the fullest uh it is i i think the preferred form of baptism that it is not the only valid form. And then we see in the Didache that that's, um, that that is the case. So, And so, Trent, I'm very grateful for your time with us this evening. So before you go, let people know what you're up to, about your channel, about any book yeah, projects. Yeah. I, you kind of refer to it, but here's an opportunity to do it all at once. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say people can check out my channel, Council of Trent, on YouTube, uh, iTunes, and Google Play, C-O-U-N-S-E-L. They can go and check that out. Uh, do rebuttals, uh, apologetics, free for all Fridays, all kinds of great stuff. I'm working on a few books right now. I'm hoping to have done by the the end of the month. Uh, lots of good things uh, happening uh, for us there. I, right now, I'm really slammed just with everything happening with Roe versus Wade being overturned. I'm very grateful, and that's one thing at the very least. I'm glad that for for many Christians that I disagree with, I'm very grateful. Even you know, say, even with you and I or with James White or Dr. Ortland that we're all, you know, fundamentally opposed to what's happening to the unborn. So I do appreciate the common ground that exists, especially among more conservative Protestants, Catholics and Orthodox, 
always happy to work together on these really big important issues, but also being able to sit down and talk about our, our theological agreements, agreements and disagreements as well. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.